All right, I think that we may start. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, this is a director's seminar, and I'm the director. Uh, my name is Gregor Zekert. Uh, um, uh, I'm professor of government uh, uh, um, here at Harvard. So um, yesterday, as you are very well aware, uh, the leader of Hungary, Viktor Orban, delivered another blow to uh, the EU. Uh, his right-wing uh, uh, nationalist party won the landslide elections uh, in Hungary and secured constitutional majority uh, in the parliament, uh, despite the fact uh, that it was the highest participation rate in, uh, in uh, any elections in the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, you know, it's quite unbelievable uh, that in uh, 30 years, Hungary moved from goulash communism to goulash authoritarianism, uh, because that's what it is, uh, what it is today. Um, this has been a great news for uh, Europe's nationalists. Uh, Marina Le Pen and Gerd Wilders were the first to congratulate uh, Mr. Urban. Um, and it was a big setback uh, to the European Commission. Uh, uh, since it really restricts the room for maneuver uh, to protect the European values. It was also a great news to uh, Polish uh, leader Kaczynski and all other nationalists in, uh, in Eastern Europe. Um, now, we are going to discuss uh, those issues uh, today, uh, the populist wave in, uh, in uh, new member states, increasing Euroscepticism uh, across uh, Eastern Europe and growing conflict between West and East of the, of the European Union. Uh, for uh, this, we have uh, very distinguished speakers and great friends of the Center for uh, uh, European Studies. Um, so Jacques Rupnik uh, uh, is uh, uh, director of research at the Center for uh, international research at Sciences Po uh, in Paris, and he's also the professor of political science there. Uh, Jacques Rupnik is also a visiting professor at College of Bruges, uh, uh, College of Europe in, uh, in Bruges, uh, has been involved uh, in a variety of activities over the years, was uh, during the Balkan crisis, was executive director of the International Commission for, uh, for the Balkans. Uh, he was also advisor to uh, Václav Havel, the former president of, uh, of Czech Republic. Uh, Jacques Rupnik uh, published widely uh, on uh, issues connected to regions, history, and politics, uh, many books and, and many articles. Uh, and he has been a frequent commentator on French media. It seems that everyone I'm in France and switch on TV, I see Jacques uh, giving another interview on some uh, important issue of the day. Um, uh, Jacques is also uh, has a degree from Harvard University and uh, has been a visiting scholar uh, at the center a number of times. Um, Radosław Sikorski returned to Poland in 1989 after getting the degree at Oxford University and serving as a war correspondent in Afghanistan, uh, in Angola. Uh, and after that, it was politics all the way. Uh, so in 92, he became deputy uh, minister of national defense, then deputy minister of foreign affairs of Poland, uh, and then served as a uh, minister of national defense from 2005 to 2007, and then minister of foreign affairs from 2007 to 2014. He was also a speaker of the Polish parliament uh, in from 2014 to 2015. Uh, uh, Radosław is a senior fellow uh, at the CES uh, and also uh, at, um, uh, uh, at Kennedy School of uh, Government. Again, he uh, is a, a frequent commentator and published widely uh, about uh, uh, current affairs in Eastern Europe. Um, the one thing which I always like to say about him is that in 2012, he was named one of the top 100 global thinkers by Foreign Policy Magazine for telling the truth even when it is not diplomatic. <laughs> Gentlemen, welcome. Radek. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you for, for the introduction. Um, but I, I'm not in complete agreement with the thesis of, uh, of our talk. 
Uh, because I think um, uh, what we are discussing here, um, populism, is, uh, goes way beyond the um, Visegrad countries. It's a pan-Western phenomenon. Uh, but whether it uh, affects the countries uh, concerned depends largely on luck. Leo Tolstoy is supposed to have said that the further we are from events, the more inevitable they seem. Um, let's just remember that in Poland, uh, we have uh, the ruling party having won 38% of the vote. Uh, Marine Le Pen, uh, who has already been mentioned, received something like 40% of the vote. Um, so um, depending on what the uh, election is and what the technical uh, rules of um, uh, elections are, you can get very different outcomes. And let us also remember that in this country, uh, if the distribution of votes was slightly different, the outcome would have been different too. Um, nevertheless, there is a, a real issue. Uh, but before I discuss it, let's, um, uh, let's um, agree some definitions. First of all, populism. It's one of those terms like sovereignty and a few others that, are, that, are, that mean different things to different people. I would put to you that um, it's not enough for a politician or a movement to be critical of, of the current elites uh, to be populist, because every opposition is, is that. To my mind, um, the unique feature of populism is that populist leaders take a part of society um, to represent the whole, with themselves having a spiritual link to that imagined whole, uh, which um, gives them the right to rule. And that which is not included in the spiritual nation or, or another group is not just wrong, is not just a competitor, it is always evil and needs to be not just kept away from power, but either symbolically or many times in the past physically eliminated. And that makes populism different from um, other political movements. And secondly, uh, I would say that uh, today we need a more sophisticated um, definition of democracy than just honest counting of votes on the day of the election. Democracy is an ecosystem which provides for competitive politics. And if you don't have a rough balance in the media, if you don't have a freedom to stand for office, if you have a judiciary that is capable, or even just a prosecution service that is capable of uh, intimidating opposition candidates, then you can still have an honest vote on the day, but it's not democracy. Now, what are the sources of populism today? Um, I would argue that populist leaders always latch onto a genuine grievance. Because there are these tendencies, the tendencies are always there, but they, are, they only become prominent and successful if there is something to play with. And I would argue that there are at least three. Number one, Europe's demographic panic, and hence the fear of the uh, uh, mass migration from North Africa and uh, Middle East. And it's a little bit like in Britain that uh, those constituencies which, with fewer, fewest foreigners uh, voted m mo more overwhelmingly for Brexit. It seems to be that the fewer migrants you have, the more you are afraid of them. A and that would certainly uh, single out uh, Hungary and Poland. Um, but it's genuine. People have felt this for decades, and more than that, they felt that elites uh, have um, made any discussion of the subject uh, illegitimate. That anybody who raised the issue of uh, an acceptable rate of migration, 
or of rules of migration, or indeed the rights of us Aborigines uh, to a certain cultural um, uh, identity and uh, prevailing culture, that that was all uh, disallowed on grounds of uh, prejudice or, or, or even racism. And, uh, and they felt offended by that. Uh, whereas I personally think that there is a non-racist way of discussing mass migration. And, um, and there are acceptable and, and, uh, and dangerous way of uh, tolerating it. Uh, in Europe, certainly, um, at the height of the migration uh, crisis, the impression was created, not entirely fairly, but still, that a million people were coming and millions more are uh, about to uh, enter the continent without any controls. That the European Union and Europe's nation states have lost control over the perimeter. And it wasn't by accident that the uh, very popular successful um, slogan of the Brexit campaign was getting back control. Um, and uh, perhaps not everybody in the United States knows that uh, we have a system called um, Schengen Zone. It's an agreement among the majority of EU member states, excluding Britain, uh, that allows not just visa-free travel, not just passport-free travel, completely unrestricted freedom of movement within the zone that comprises 90% uh, of uh, EU territory. In other words, the specter was risen that anybody who succeeds in breaching the outer perimeter can then settle anywhere. And that's why uh, in Poland, for example, uh, which voted at the height of that crisis, the leader of the Polish Populist Party was, was, was successfully made the argument um, that um, uncontrolled numbers of Muslims are coming this way. And it worked. Whereas I, pers I, I also feel that uh, it is not, you don't have to be prejudiced to um, make the judgment that if you have a high welfare area on one side of a sea, and on the other side, you have a, a not just low welfare area, but no state area. Uh, then, of course, people and goods will flow where they command a higher price. And it's um, the fear that there is a billion of people on the other side of the pond who quite rationally would rather live here than, than there um, was not irrational. Uh, but liberal elites, as I said, did not find a civilized um, language in which, in which to discuss the issue. Um, secondly, I don't think it was the um, financial crisis per se, uh, because, for example, Poland in that case would have to be a counterexample because we haven't had a single year of recession for 27 years. And the Gini coefficient, which measures uh, social inequalities, has been steadily dropping in Poland. Poland is a more equal society today than it was 20 years ago. Therefore, it can't be that. It's something else. It's, it's to my mind, as a politician, um, it's been growing for years. The, um, uh, uh, again, not unfounded conviction by millions of people that um, the institutions of modern capitalism have been captured, uh, that rules are unfair, and that transnational corporations and the most wealthy citizens do not contribute their fair share of taxation to the common kitty. Uh, and we could expand on that, but I think we all know that, uh, that there is something to that. And then thirdly and lastly, I think this concerns Poland and the United States in particular. Um, um, th this is more difficult to prove or even uh, to make a persuasive argument, but it's just my gut feeling that in both countries, there's been a 
a precipitous collapse in religiosity. And that the populist wave is um, partly the despair of people who correctly think that a certain way of life, a certain attitude to the world, is in danger of disappearing. I'll just give you an example. I, I'm friendly with a, a local parish uh, priest. We live in deep countryside in Poland. And in November, the Catholic uh, Church in Poland um, counts the number of uh, people attending Mass. And they do it every year on the same day so that you can compare. Uh, and a couple of years ago, I asked our priest, well, how did it go? How many souls uh, attended? And he said, same as usual. What do you mean by that? Oh, one percent uh, less every year. It's now at about 35 percent regular attendance at church in Poland, which is, which is to say that in a few more years' time, uh, Catholicism will no longer be able to claim to really command the uh, the majority uh, uh, the, the majority view. Um, let me conclude by saying that we've had the populist movements before, including in this country. There was something called the Silver Movement at the turn of the 19th and 20th century when, uh, when deflation was uh, squeezing uh, farmers and there was a demand to go from gold standard to silver standard, which really meant uh, 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 loosen, loosening the uh, fiscal and monetary policies in those days. And how do you resolve populist crisis? You resolve it by identifying those parts of the populist appeal that make sense, that, uh, that are to some extent justified, and you take away the issue from the populace by fixing the problem. And uh, this is, I think, what uh, liberal elites have to do to stem the wave, because to um, go back to the uh, topic, the pressure from Brussels, uh, I am not convinced, is either the right way or that it will work. National elites the world over throughout history have always been um, very adept at mobilizing particularly populist uh, appeal uh, groups uh, against external pressure. Um, Europe's um, rules, uh, Article 7, um, that Poland voted for when we were discussing it and approving it in the uh, uh, Foreign Affairs Council, including the, um, the, um, uh, the details of it, uh, I, I was in the room and it would never have occurred to me that it would one day be threatened against Poland, but there we are. Um, but it's unlikely to work because Europe is a confederation with ultimate sovereignty residing in the member states and its rules are not the rules of a federal state like the United States where the central government can, and even here, as we know, with limits, uh, take action against states. No, in Europe, um, member states are equals and all they can do is, through peer review, um, say that uh, what you're doing is not right. Um, um, one of my favorite sayings comes from India. If you can't be a lion, don't be a mosquito. If the European Union can't force a member state to change its behavior, it shouldn't even try because the result will be counterproductive. Thank you. Jacques Rupnik. Well, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for the invitation. Great to be back, as always. Um, I will try to follow on what uh, Radek Sikorski has, uh, has just uh, outlined, perhaps uh, then skipping some of the uh, references to definitions of populism, because I think we will get to that in the discussion. And uh, um, 
starting by saying that the results of the Hungarian election uh, will be interpreted, at least in Hungary, possibly uh, more broadly, as the vindication of a policy uh, of an authoritarian drift which uh, doesn't shy from confrontation with the European Union. I was in Budapest uh, a week ago. I spent quite a few, uh, uh, I had a quite a few meetings there with the people close to Orban and his uh, sort of master thinkers, uh, the ideologists, one would have said in the old days. Uh, and, and that is very much the terms in which they see the current uh, predicament as a, as a, uh, a confrontation uh, with Brussels, that is the title of, uh, of, uh, uh, of this session, uh, but more a, a fight for the meaning of what Europe is supposed to be. That, that is how they would um, uh, say. So um, I will briefly perhaps spell out what are some of the contentious issues between uh, the countries of uh, uh, Visegrad uh, and, and the EU. Uh, what are some of the explanations Few of them have already been mentioned, and I, uh, I mostly agree with what has been said about that. Um, and what are the limits of this divergence, this, uh, 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 this uh, drift? Uh, uh, because, as I said, the debate has been framed that way, but perhaps not just, not just in Budapest or in Warsaw. It is also framed that way in Western Europe, in the Western media, that there is the return of the divide uh, uh, in uh, uh, between East and West within uh, within Europe, uh, just to um, uh, just to give you a hint of what uh, kind of uh, rhetoric you hear in uh, in Budapest, um, uh, you you have a, you have an atmosphere where uh, a country is besieged, the country is under siege, under threat. And this is a quote uh, uh, from Orban, infiltrated by an enemy which is hiding an army of mercenaries, uh, 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 etc., uh, whose aim to replace Europe's present population and change its very foundations. Okay, this is how the issues are framed uh, 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 for the election. On Friday, just before the election, uh, uh, Orban said on, on Radio Kosciut, either we shall have national government and Hungarians will remain Hungarian and we shall fight for a European Europe, or there will be an internationalist government which will essentially be formed by George Soros and the country will become a land of migrants. Okay, this is a statement from the prime minister on the eve of the election. So you, you, it, it's as clear as uh, it uh, gets. And uh, 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 of course, the whole thing is about the definition then what is Europe or what it is to be European. That is uh, the debate between, if you want, the Visegrad countries and, and, uh, uh, and the EU today. Uh, just a reminder for those uh, who had forgotten what the Visegrad group was about. I was so to speak, present at the creation with President Havel. Uh, the idea initially uh, was launched by, by Havel in Poland in his first speech in the Polish Sejm in, in January 1990. And he outlines the situation and he basically says the countries of Central Europe must, to avoid certain uh, 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 drawbacks of the past, they have to... Um, uh, cooperate in democratic uh, uh, transformation. They have to resist nationalist temptations, which always ended up uh, uh, badly. And they have a common goal, which is uh, the uh, European future, European integration. That was, he, he says that in his speech in the Polish same. Uh, he adds very interestingly, uh, we're not entering, we don't want to enter Europe as beggars, you know, asking for subsidies or something like that. We want to bring in the experience that we have had 
in fighting totalitarian regimes, we have certain values, democratic liberal values, that we uh, want to contribute to a Europe, which too often is bogged down, so to speak, in more mundane uh, issues. So there's an emphasis on, on the values, and there is a, 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 a geopolitical argument. He says, we have to join Europe, uh, not just because this is where we belong, but because there's been a geopolitical void, there's a risk of a geopolitical void in Central Europe after the demise, of course, of uh, uh, the, the two blocks, the, 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 the old uh, Cold War system. And he goes even further, and it goes back to the demise of the Austrian Empire, the void that has been left by the Austrian Empire. So there's this idea that there's also a geopolitical case for the Visegrad group, but it has a democratic agenda, and it is Europe uh, uh, oriented. I'm just uh, <laughs> recapping this uh, uh, for, for the sake of the contrast with today, because we have today a contrast on, on all accounts, so to speak. We have, a, we have a, on democratization, where well, we have a, a, a democratic regression, uh, to, to put it mildly, uh, instead of uh, 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 opposition to nationalist uh, uh, ideas of the past, we have a uh, uh, return to uh, to many of them, and instead of seeing uh, European integration as a, as a value, we have Orban uh, uh, explicitly presenting a case for uh, opposing it. So we have a reversal, actual reversal of what Visegrad was supposed to be. Well, that doesn't mean Visegrad uh, ceases to exist. This is a group of these. Uh, four countries, Poland, it used to be four, Poland, Hungary, uh, uh, and Czechoslovakia, and then it became Czech Republic. And I just also to, to, to remember, it was founded by three uh, uh, former dissidents. Václav Havel was a president, Lech Walesa was then president, and Arpad Gönc was a Hungarian president. So you had three dissidents, and they were very different, of course, each of them, but more or less, that was, that was the uh, zeitgeist <laughs> of that founding moment. Well, we, have a com we are in complete uh, 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 reversal mode. And uh, 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 if one is looking at the situation today, uh, the uh, contentious issues with Europe, it's been mentioned, there is the uh, uh, question of the state of democracy, challenge to liberal democracy, basically undoing the rule of law. This is the most important. From the, Euro from the European point of view, I would say this is the most important because the whole European project rests on the <laughs> rule of law. You can have nice declaration about shared values, but at the end of the day, uh, uh, the system functions because you, uh, uh, because you have the rule of law. You can trust, if you have a differences of uh, opinion or, or interest or whatever, that there is uh, 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 arbitration, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, uh, rule of law is being challenged in Hungary, in Poland, in a milder form in other places. Control of the media by uh, uh, the government, uh, particularly uh, public broadcasting, uh, and public administration is the third element uh, that goes uh, into it. I, uh, there's lots been written and discussed about Poland and Hungary. I don't want to dwell on, on them because that is familiar ground. I would simply add, Czech Republic and Slovakia are below the radar screen, fortunately for them. But if you look at close range, which is my case, this is what I'm doing, uh, uh, the picture is not a very attractive one. And, uh, um, well, just look at Slovakia right now. The government fell because of a major corruption scandal. It, you discovered that Italian mafia has been uh, basically putting its hand into the European funds. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, Prime Minister Fico had to resign uh, over this issue. And there's a major political crisis. Tens of thousands of people demonstrating every day, etc. So you have a major political crisis there. And Fizzo has been replaced to dismantle the Italian mafia there uh, by a new prime minister called Pellegrini. So that uh, is certainly very appropriate, I would have thought, for this uh, situation. On the Czech, uh, on the Czech side, uh, we have two names of the problem, uh, Babish and Zeman. Uh, how to help? Prime, Prime Minister Banish, Babish won the election with 30 percent, but uh, and he's not uh, uh, denouncing the European Union like Orbán does every day. Uh, 
But, you know, he says things like, the state should be run by a, like a company. Uh, and his party is called Anno, which means yes, but it never says yes to what? Uh, it basically means yes to him, which is the very definition of a, of a populist movement which relies on a strong leader. Efficiency, the parliament is a talk shop. Jvanirna, it's, it's a vulgar name for a talk shop. They just chat, they're useless. Let me do things, I'm a doer. Okay, uh, that kind of thing. So th this is not, it, it doesn't have the abrasive type of Orban. It, it doesn't do some of the things that you, we have seen in Poland recently. But yeah, it's a certain type of uh, moving away from, let's say, uh, uh, what we understood uh, uh, as democracy. And as for the uh, presidential elections, which took place only in January, you really had very clear case of uh, opposition between a nationalist populist uh, President Zeman uh, uh, versus a professor of physics, uh, of uh, chemistry, sorry, from the Academy of Science, who was a well-meaning liberal intellectual with a pro-European agenda, but who unfortunately <laughs> didn't have very much uh, as to say, except what I just said, it about two sentences, and that's about uh, as much as he would uh, go. And not surprisingly, it is the uh, populist demagogue that won, but in, for our subject, interestingly, the posters that you would see in Prague in between the two rounds would be stop migration, stop Drahosh. Drahosh is the name of the other candidate. So uh, here it is a country. There's no migrants in, in the Czech Republic. I think they took 12 uh, 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 asylum seekers. <laughs> and the poster is stop migrants, stop Drahoš. And what does Drahoš say to that? Oh, I agree with the first part of the proposition. <laughs> All right, well, you know, that's not terribly helpful in dealing with uh, the uh, uh, essence of the problem. So this is just to say that when we talk about Visegrad, yeah, we have a common problem about the democratic situation in Visegrad. It's not just a, a, a Polish-Hungarian uh, aberration, although this is where the partnership, as you know, is the strongest between the two leaders. Uh, the explanations. Uh, some have been mentioned, and I will not, uh, uh, I, I agree with them. The, the demographic factor is absolutely crucial. And I agree also with the fact that the socioeconomic explanation, which has been very often used in explaining populism in the West, in Western Europe, uh, is very limited in Central Europe because the countries are doing well. Poland is doing well economically. Czech Republic, you know, even better. They never had it so good. I mean, they've been growing. Unemployment is the lowest in Europe. They're below 3%. They need workforce. And they're bringing in migrants from Ukraine. They bring, you know, the Czech construction industry couldn't function without Ukrainians. So uh, 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 this is the economic situation. You, you look at television debate uh, for the parliamentary elections, and you have guys arguing, you know, should we increase the salaries of teachers by 10%? And the other says, no, we should increase by 15%. Okay, so this is a debate. In France, this would seem completely surrealistic, a debate like that. But this is the country that's doing well. The coffers are full. And uh, the government, uh, after four years in office, is being uh, uh, thrown out, uh, loses two-thirds of its votes, the Social Democratic Party, uh, and uh, Babish, the only strong man, survives. So the economic explanation, the reason I'm saying this, doesn't work. And uh, uh, what I said in a nutshell about the poster between the two rounds of the election, if you don't have much to say, you simply say, stop migrants. Uh, that is the issue. And uh, yes, uh, you can frame it more broadly as part of what one could describe as culture wars, as uh, the rejection of uh, liberal concept, not just of politics, that was the first part I referred to, rule of law, separation, but no, li societal liberalism. And the idea that the EU is associated with this kind of societal liberalism. What does EU promote? And this is what you hear in Budapest. I heard it last week, but you hear the same thing in Prague and elsewhere. What does Europe stand for? Well, you know, they, the gender issues and gay marriage and this and that. And multiculturalism, of course, is the ultimate uh, 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 this is the main part of this left liberal agenda that EU is apparently or 
allegedly promoting and forcing down their throat. How do they force it down their throat? Through the quota system. The quotas of redistribution of migrants is read, is perceived, or is, is, is denounced as an attempt to impose a model of society. You're trying to force on us to a model of multicultural society, which has failed in your countries. France is very often singled out as a country where the failure is most obvious, you know, et, et, et cetera. So uh, that is the terms in which the anti-European posture is. Right? It's not just the uh, political fight about the rule of law. Uh, it's about the EU allegedly promoting a concept of society that, uh, uh, that they uh, uh, reject. And interestingly, uh, I've just spent some time talking to some of the people who are the supposedly the brains uh, behind the Orban party. And that is a theme that comes up uh, continuously, that uh, Europe really has now totally abandoned its core values. We are the true defenders of Europe and European values. Look at it. I've heard from the leader of the Fidesz faction in parliament, a very smart young man who, in a way, was, could have been the Fidesz of 20 years ago. It's a fairly mild, well-spoken, articulate, uh, great. Uh, but he uh, had this interesting point. He said, we are the last conservatives, true conservatives attached to European values in Europe. Look at what happened to CDU. CDU has now endorsed gay marriage. What kind of Christian Democratic Party is that? If the Christian Democratic parties, if the conservative parties endure, I no, no longer care about families, no longer care about the nation, no longer care about true defense of Christian values in Europe, well, they are doomed. They are no longer uh, conservative parties. They've been swallowed by this European liberal thing. And we are, so to speak, the ultimate upholders of what true European uh, 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 values uh, should be. Uh, 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 I, I had a quote that he had told me, no freedom without identity, and the EU is an instrument to dissolve identities. This is, this is the, the way the threat has been uh, formulated. I would, uh, so this is, this is, this is the, the, the language, this is the kind of reading of Europe that you get. Um, what is, uh, what is interesting is we should not consider this. I mean, it is particularly strong there, but it is not just a Central European aberration. Look at what, has, uh, uh, what you hear from Austria today. Well, that is part, I suppose, of the Central European syndrome. Uh, uh, Austria, yeah, you, you have it there. Uh, uh, Kurds and, and the far-right party, they more or less are on the Orban line uh, on, 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 on most of these uh, issues, but they don't take the anti-European rhetoric. So this is smart. You know, this is where they stop. They, they buy part of the thing, not uh, uh, the other. But they have this idea that they should be close to Visegrad, they should build bridges to Visegrad, and... Uh, well, there were days when they wanted to be part of Visegrad, I remember, and Havel would, would, would definitely uh, not be uh, in favor of that. So you have the Austrian. I don't have to mention the Italian elections, but uh, just a quote from uh, uh, Manfred Weber, uh, the uh, head of the uh, CSU uh, faction parliament. Uh, if we want to defend our lifestyles, we have to know what defines us as we have to know what defines us. Europe must have a debate about its identity and its dominant culture. Uh, okay, the, the, the language is not exactly that, of, but you see the leaning. We, uh, 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 the CSU, uh, has understood that um, uh, there is also a public in Western Europe. There is uh, an electorate in Western Europe. And this is not just Marine Le Pen and, and people like that. Incidentally, she didn't get 40%. She, she got about a third of the electorate, which was a lot. In the second round, uh, in the first round, she was at 23, I think, uh, uh, percent, which is, uh, which is a hell of a lot. Uh, but uh, 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 so uh, 
what this is, uh, I, uh, this is where uh, I want to uh, conclude on what uh, the EU response uh, uh, is and what are the limits of, the, of this uh, uh, drift. Um, on migration, which is a divisive issue, interestingly, the EU had the quota system. Visegrad said we will have not, none of it. Confrontation came, and you had two things. First, Slovakia took the EU to court. Slovakia actually took the European Commission to court. They lost eventually, but this shows how far they were prepared to go, and they, were, they got the support of Orban. But the whole of Visegrad was uh, 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 united. And then you had, the, under Slovak presidency of the EU, uh, uh, you had, uh, in 2016, uh, you have a resolution which says that, uh, yes, there should be solidarity, but on voluntary basis. OK, so you, you, it's basically uh, a fairly, uh, yeah, you could call it a kind of capitulation by the commission <laughs> in front of uh, certain re realities. On the rule of law issue, the confrontation, uh, there is a nice, I think, interesting contrast between what has been happening, EU response towards Hungary and towards Poland. Towards Hungary, because that goes to uh, Orbán's coming to power in 2010, and he started doing some of the things immediately. You know, the law on the press was immediately, and, and then the uh, new constitution, and then, uh, 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 yeah, tampering with the constitutional court, etc. Very lukewarm response, you know, the odd letter from Mrs. Nelly Cross, uh, who was then commissioner, and, uh, and you know, uh, and then he would make an amendment or something. But basically, uh, 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 nothing much happened. And I think the contrast is striking with the way uh, the response to, 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 to Poland came. Because, you know, you have the election, you have the new laws adopted in December, uh, over, you know, around Christmas, or the law on the press, and then the law on the constitutional court, or within a very short lapse of time. Immediately in January, you have the response from the uh, vice president of the, uh, of the uh, commission, and uh, uh, sort of three steps. First, uh, uh, asking explanations about what is happening. Then there is a process of evaluation. And eventually, as you know, it has ended up now with the question about uh, uh, the, whether the uh, uh, procedure should go as far as uh, suspending the, the voting rights. Of course, none of this will happen because the, none of the Visegrad countries would want it. Orban already said it, and he would uh, uh, oppose it. But it is interesting, I think, the contrast. There is a kind of learning process on the part of the EU as well. They let it go on in the case of Hungary, in the case of Poland, also because it's a, a important country, perhaps, uh, uh, in the EU. They realize this is serious. They, they, the, the response was, uh, uh, was tougher. Um, uh, in, um, uh, in, there is another contrast of Poland and Hungary. Why has Hungary got away? Uh, so much e more easily than Poland, while it's doing more or less the same thing, basically. Okay, uh, you, you understand what, what, what I'm getting at. I would say the, the, the main explanation is that, is that uh, uh, Orbán's Fidesz is part uh, of the e European People's Party, EPP. And that has been the protection shield from way back, way back. And you know when he established it? He established it in 2000, when uh, Schussel, there was a coalition of Schusselheider in Austria. Austria has been ostracized, if I can use it. And uh, uh, it, uh, um, uh, uh, for, for one year, uh, uh, there was a commission that was supposed to evaluate uh, you know, whether democracy was under threat in Austria, etc. And the first person who did a press conference with Schussel was, guess whom? Viktor Orban. He was not member of the European Union. But he was Hungarian prime minister, and he understood the significance of what was happening, that one day this may concern him. He did a second smart thing from his point of view. Not only he had Schussel as an ally and the Austrian conservatives, but also the Bavarian CSU. The Bavarian CSU was interested in the abrogation of the Benesch decrees. And Orban invant, in, invited uh, Stoiber, the leader of the CSU at the time, to his Congress of Fides, which he attended to, and Orban 
promised at that Congress that Hungary would insist, just like the CSU and the FOP, the Czechos Czech Republic and Slovakia must abrogate the Benes decrees of 1945 if they want to become members of the European Union as a condition for membership. Okay, this is where the alliance has been sealed. I must not go on tour because, uh, but you understand that he had a strategy from very early on to build a coalition of like-minded, let's say, political forces. Then within the European People's Party, he became vice president. He never misses an opportunity when he's in the media, not in Hungary, but when he gives an interview to, to, to Western media to remind people that he's vice president of the EPP. And if you watched last year's, as I did, the video of the Congress of uh, 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 EPP parties in, in Madrid, he gave a speech and he, I mean, he got more applause than Chancellor Merkel. Uh, so uh, this was the Hungarian strategy, the EP, European People's Party as a protection shield. Poland chose the wrong protection shield, and that was the British Conservatives, who uh, 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 are in Brexit mode uh, became pretty useless on the European uh, scene. And uh, I'm not saying that that explains everything, but, it, but, but the contrast is, uh, uh, I've been going on for, 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 for too long. Just in telegraphic style, the limits about the drift from the Visegrad countries vis-a-vis -vis EU, I would say, you have first the uh, importance, the ex extraordinary benefits they do get from the EU in terms of the structure of funds. It's about 4% for Hungary, it's about three and something for Poland. All of them are doing quite well with that. And there is now a debate actually within the EU to what extent ties should be made, conditionality should be made about the future use of that fund. Why is it important? Because we are in a period where budget is being discussed. So this is very important. I'm not saying it's not easy to establish the connection because you will be accused of blackmail immediately, uh, but uh, uh, there is a context of a budgetary discussion uh, 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 that, is, that is taking part. The, uh, uh, the uh, limits, the second limit I see is a geopolitical one. Whatever else uh, is happening in Poland, in Slovakia, in Czech Republic, etc., uh, the, yes, they resent the EU. They oppose, as I say, on the uh, rule of law, on the uh, cultural wars. But at the end of the day, if you are situated in that part of the country, uh, of Europe, uh, back to Havel's question about the geopolitical void, you see Russia and the way it is treating uh, Ukraine and some of its neighborhoods, uh, that is a very strong incentive not to push the confrontation with the EU too far. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, we have a lot of hopeful news, uh, and we only mentioned Russia once. Uh, so uh, let me open the floor, but before uh, um, um, uh, uh, the rules of the game are that please introduce yourself and try to keep the remarks uh, uh, within reasonable limits. So, yes, thank you. So, can you hear me? Yeah, uh, thank you. I have to pick up my kids, so I will have to leave. I'm sorry. Uh, but I have uh, questions for both of you, and thank you for those very interesting um, insights. I would uh, like to hear a bit more about the demographic causes. As I read recently, um, Eastern European sources telling that maybe the, the youth was not exactly on the same line as the older voters for Orban. And maybe that would nuance a bit your uh, picture. Uh, I would also tend to discuss your, um, your analysis of the causes for this populism, which I agree with you. I mean, concerns all of Europe, not only uh, the Visegrad countries, but uh, it seems that if it's not the proper economic um, causes that play out, maybe it's a matter of relative frustration that still plays out between those who feel unprotected and those who feel fully integrated in the liberal game. And, I, and that brings me to my, to my question, which is, maybe liberal elites of Europe need to question themselves on the kind of liberal package that they have offered to people since the big transition to democracy and, and the market. 
And I think that even in, you know, in Western Europe, this is also a question. So maybe uh, European elites and national elites need to acknowledge this need for protection that is also part of the global world and, and they are not answering to that fear. So maybe the, you know, the elites have to question themselves a bit about that. Thank you. When I referred to demography, I wasn't um, thinking about the um, uh, electoral split between uh, old and, and young, which was uh, the most uh, glaring divide in the Brexit vote, for example. No, I was, I was referring to the fact that uh, um, every year, um, the population of Europe is becoming a smaller proportion of the world's population. And that in Poland, for example, we used to think of ourselves as a 40 million nation. We are now a 38 million nation. Uh, firstly, because uh, we don't have a re replacement rate, but also because over a million people have left. Um, um, and, and, you know, that's, that's something that bothers people, that um, it's a new situation for us. Um, uh, when you say relative frustration, I think you're onto something. Um, one of the mistakes that uh, our presidential candidate um, made was to think that he can get re-election by... Um, pointing to Poland's success. And indeed, Poland has had the most successful quarter century in its history. We started in 1989 at the level of being the poorest in our history in peacetime ever. Uh, we had about 33% um, of GDP per head by comparison with the GB, GDP per head of the EU15 at that time. We are now close to 70% of the Western European average. An amazing rate of catch-up. Of Poland's global GDP divided by its population. And here's the catch that I personally didn't uh, realize uh, b before the election. When you have a country which has an um, uh, unusually high uh, proportion of foreign investment in the economy, the GDP measures also the activity of foreign companies, which then, um, you know, just like our companies investing abroad, uh, repatriate their, their dividends abroad. So the GDP doesn't accrue to wages, it accrues to capital. So wages have not kept up with the growth of GDP. And here, uh, uh, relative frustration is, I think, a good, uh, a good name for what's happened. Um, liberal package, need for protection. Sure, if you can pay for it. Uh, I mean, Chancellor Merkel is fond of saying that Europe has 8% uh, of uh, the world's population. Uh, uh, popula uh, sorry, don't quote me on the figures, but it's something like 6% of the world's population, 8% of the world's economy, and something like 30% of the world's social spending. Um, uh, uh, but it's true that in Poland, for example, the ruling party uh, brought in a universal child benefit, which is very popular and which was needed. It's probably a little too high, but it was needed. Um, uh, the real challenge, I think, is to, is to, is to tackle the um, shortage of revenue by nation states, by starting to tax wealthy individuals and uh, uh, transnational companies fairly, because at the moment they pay what they will. And, and here is, I think, where the populists have it dramatically wrong. Um, namely, um, you can't really do that on a national basis. Uh, only when Europe, as an economic superpower, decides to 
um, punish Google or Apple or Facebook? Uh, does it work? And it's the same, actually, on migration. You see what the populists do, their favorite game, is to blame the EU for the faults of the member states. Why, why did the um, migration crisis happen? Because Greece was unable to um, control its perimeter, its external frontier, and refused help from frontier services of other countries. Um, so, in fact, if you want to control the perimeter, you need a stronger Frontex, and you need a stronger, perhaps, defense policy to secure the other side of the, of, of the sea. In other words, you need more Europe, not less, because si individual member states are not capable of, 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 of stemming this crisis. Um, so th I think they have it back, back to front. Jack? Would you like to? Well, uh, I would simply add that the youth factor uh, can play in, in different ways. Uh, yes, on the whole, you assume that the urban educated youth, uh, yet yeah, they vote uh, for uh, liberal parties rather than for, for the nationalists. Not everywhere. And uh, uh, you can see that in, in Hungary, for instance, you're big. Uh, is a party which has not only youth membership, but also youth voters, uh, a far-right party. Uh, so, it, uh, you know, the youth is not uh, uh, in itself a guarantee. Also, in the Hungarian case, uh, you have a youth exodus now. You have, you have really, in the last 10 years or so, especially, I mean, let's say the Orban years, you now have people who uh, uh, opt for... Uh, Exit rather than voice, so this is this is uh, this is yes a, a serious uh, serious problem. Um, on the uh, need for protection, well, you have two kinds. You have the social question: people who would seek protection. As I say, in Central Europe, this is not a big uh, 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 this is not a big issue in itself, because these are countries that are very much oriented to trade. They want trade. So, uh, in surveys, you don't have opposition to globalization and global trade, the, the economic side of globalization. They, they are part of that, and you have, you know, over 60%, I mean, two-thirds of Central Europeans do not have problem with that. The kind of protection they want is the other kind, from, uh, from migration. Now, of course, you, you can point to the uh, compatibility of the two. That, that, that is a different matter. But the, uh, the demand for protection for the borders, why is it strong uh, or stronger perhaps in Central Europe than it where they don't have mass migration? That, that is an interesting question. I, we don't have much time, but in, in telegraphic style, I would say, first of all, you have the building of more homogeneous nation states uh, historically, you know, by the time World War II ends. You have Poland is more homogeneous, uh, Czech Republic, uh, for the first time is more homogeneous, no more Jews, the Germans have been expelled, etc., etc. So you have more homogeneous. Secondly, in the Cold War, uh, you couldn't leave, but you couldn't get in. So you didn't have mig in migration. And so while Western Europe was becoming to receive uh, uh, migrants from uh, former colonies, from Africa, from North Africa, etc., or from Turkey in the case of Germany, from India, Pakistan, for England, etc. Uh, none of this occurred there. And by the time the Cold War ended and o borders opened, the migrations they would get uh, would be either from the East, Ukrainians, etc., or uh, uh, from Yugoslavia uh, during the war in former Yugoslavia. They didn't get so there is, I would say, non-exposure to this kind of uh, uh, diversity. So you have much more homogeneous concept of nation, and you combine that with a historic understanding of what nationhood is. These are kultur nation. These are nations built on cultural identity, nations without a state. So uh, 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 cultural identity is absolutely crucially important. Uh, sometimes it has a religious dimension. You add to it the uh, historic uh, memories of uh, uh, Turkish uh, uh, um, uh, threats uh, in uh, way back, you know, arriving to Budapest in the 16th century uh, uh, and stopped at Vienna in 1683 by Sobieski, etc. Uh, 
you can revive that kind of historical narratives for uh, 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 selling a policy uh, of uh, protection. And you frame it in those uh, uh, historical terms and in this need of protecting uh, the identity of the nation. I gave you a few quotes from that. I could go on about what... Uh, they, it is absolutely uh, 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 stunning what they... The fear... I mean, there is the demographic fear you, you, you refer to, but there is this fear about the loss of identity. They're going to dissolve our identity in the European thing. And, and that, that, I think, is... A, quite a contrast with Western Europe. I'm not saying those anxieties don't exist there, but it is. Yeah, I can just complement um, <coughs> this fear of loss of identity as regards Poles and Hungarians, I find personally particularly amusing because <coughs> these, are, these are the two hardest languages in, in Europe. <laughs> and the, the, these are the, some of the strongest identities in the world. Um, um, but... Um, I, I want to co complement something else. I, I think it, it's actually quite deep, the fact that neither Poland nor Hungary had colonies and were colonized themselves, particularly Poland, means that there wasn't the um, moral reaction against colonialism and there wasn't the, um, uh, uh, the political correctness in the way uh, of talking about other cultures. People don't feel guilt and therefore feel entitled to, as they would see it, like it is, right? Secondly, you hinted at this, but I'd like to stress because I think it's important. Communism, for 45 years, contributed to the reprovincialization of these countries. Um, and thirdly, um, you know, people are sensitive to hypocrisy. And they th think West Europeans are a bunch of hypocrites, and they're not wrong. You talk to, as I did for many years, off the record to French politicians, and they'll tell you off the record, oh, my God, we have six million Muslims. We can't stop uh, uh, terrorism. It's terrible. What are we going to do about it? And then they'll go um, on the record and say, no, 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 nothing to do with Islam. Uh, and people can tell, you know, and, and they really object. Yeah, it is now. You both uh, pointed to the fact of the threat perception of, of migration, but if you look at what is happening now, the, the, the importance of that factor is decreasing. Migration is getting more or less organized. It is being reduced. The external protection increases. So my question to you is, wouldn't that affect this Culture war argument, at, not right away, but at least as we look in the future. And my second question is uh, more or less to Radek, because uh, Jacques, you, you, um, you made a reference already to it. Uh, the young Hungarians leave. Of course, there are some young Poles who have left. There are lots of them outside in, in Britain, for example, working there. But how do you assess the fact of that, you know, Poland is modernizing. It, is, it has an open border. People go in and out. The young generation moves. Uh, the church adherence is going down, as you said yourself. Isn't that a factor of change in the long run? Um, well, you're, you're right. The, 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 the uh, migration crisis is over. Uh, it's certainly not in its chronic phase. Uh, but now it's politics. <laughs> One of my favorite um, examples of how uh, cynical um, my old friend Victor is uh, with this issue is that um, certainly at the height of the migration crisis, I don't know about um, today, but um, he put, put up hundreds if not thousands of posters, bill, huge billboards around Hungary Migrants, please respect our Hungarian culture in Hungarian. <laughs> All right, this is pure politics. It works. It, it works 
uh, because it also helps to take attention away from what these um, populist countries are becoming very rapidly. C certainly in Hungary, it um, takes attention away from the corruption. Uh, Hungary, Czech Republic, we now know Slovakia as well, are really corrupt now. Poland less so, I would say. Um, uh, but it's, uh, it, 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 it's a mobili mobilizing factor. And on, on Poland modernizing, I'm always skeptical about this uh, argument that youth will be different. No, I mean, unless you have education, youth um, repeats the patterns established uh, uh, by elders. And the really depressing thought, this is not about Poland, about all of the West, is that and this was predicted already in the, in the 60s, that tribalism may be the logical outcome of meritocracy. When you have selection for the best jobs, for uh, political office, for all kinds of things, based on merit, you are inevitably leaving the majority frustrated because not everybody can be, can be talented. And this was predicted in the 60s that, that people who feel that they are relatively not succeeding as much as others um, will fall back on ethnic and tribal identities. You see, in an unfair system, your dignity is not affected because you can blame the system. But when everybody feels that the system is fair, then you're really angry because your own self-respect uh, is under threat. Dangerous and, uh, um, uh, and um, unpleasant thought, I think. Well, uh, just to... Uh, one would like to believe that if the uh, migration wave is, uh, has, so to speak, got under control or that, the, uh, um, that there is a feeling that uh, there is an uh, efficient European response, that, the, um, that somehow the arguments that have been put forward in this crisis will uh, subside. I'm not uh, totally sure because they've been proved... Uh, rather effective, and once you unleash this kind of rhetoric and this language, it's very hard to, uh, uh, to bring back, you know, the, uh, to, to, to get back into reverse gear. That I don't know. Uh, also, there is a disconnect between, uh, between reality. You can, uh, just as you can have anti-Semitism without Jews, you can have uh, uh, Islamophobia without Muslims, etc., etc. So this is uh, the fact that you will have less migrants uh, uh, and also, thirdly, there is an element, because I, I had often this discussion, uh, particularly uh, in Prague, you know, uh, uh, and uh, uh, why are you so afraid? I mean, you don't, you don't have any, you know. I mean, there are less than 5,000 Muslim in, in, in the Czech Republic, so I said, you know, and I live in a country where there are 5 million, so, uh, you know, you should relativize your fears. I'm not saying this is not a problem, it's a huge problem, etc. but, you know, uh, you are not. And... Uh, that, that doesn't hold because they feel they are part of the European Union, the borders are open, and somehow they consider what they see on television, what they see when they travel in Europe, etc. They see it as part of what, uh, uh, what Europe is and perhaps what is coming to them. I'm not saying this is a very rational explanation, etc., but uh, uh, there is this common space. It's not that uh, they, they feel part of that space and they want protection. I mean, the amusing thing is, for instance, the Czechs. The presi Czech presidency of the European Union in, 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 two, in the spring of 2009 had as a motto uh, 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 Europe without barriers. Uh, now, they all demand we should close, etc. And uh, you have opinion polls which says, you know, uh, uh, if uh, this policy doesn't work, would you then uh, prefer to reestablish the borders as they were, etc.? You have, 
I forgot the exact figure. You have, uh, you know, two thirds of the people say yes, bring it back. So, uh, yeah, the rational, arg the, ra the rational argument is the one you put in. If the European Union is capable of demonstrating it can control the migration wave, yes, uh, that, that, that kind of rhetoric should prove less efficient. Uh, one would hope that is true. I, I'd just like to give two more examples. Um, um, because it's true that people, f that, uh, and, and they're right, that under Schengen, anybody from France can, and they feel, well, where would you rather live? In one of the banlieues around Paris or in Prague? <laughs> right? And, and this can be done. And secondly, <laughs> some of the parts of Paris. Yeah, sure. Um, but on the whole. Um, and, and then they also discriminate culturally. In Poland, we have a million Ukrainians. It's not an issue. People, you, you can condemn it, but that's how people feel. That there are um, sources of migration that are culturally compatible and that will, uh, that will um, be easy to integrate. And then there are sources of migration which are going to be hard to integrate. And you make your judgment whether it's true or not. Could you bring the mic to the second row? Thank you. Thank you for your talks. Um, I understood the main upshot of your um, uh, presentation to be that liberals should reclaim the issues and, and, and take them seriously, the, the three issues that you outlined. But of course, the underlying question is, well, what if the rules of the game are changing and the level, there's no level playing field? That, that, that the position of the liberals to address these issues through the media um, is systematically being uh, suppressed and that indeed the media are being controlled by the populist discourse. I mean, so isn't this a bit naive to put a lot of confidence in that liberals can still reclaim that debate if actually the, the, the structure of the public sphere is being transformed and undermined and, and being challenged. That's one question. And to extend it a bit to particularly your third issue. So you were talking about the decline of religios religiosity. And there I found it hard. What is the liberal answer there? Because liberalism, in my sense, is inherently pluralist um, and maybe even essentially multiculturalism. So whatever your answer is, I mean, aren't you paying, kind of playing into the culture, culture war game that Jack was talking about? Um, and aren't liberals inherently with less of a, have less of an answer to that thing? I mean, it's not very liberal to say, well, let's become cat all Catholic again. Um, so, so I'm not sure what the answer is on that line. Funny you should mention that. The interior minister of Poland at the time of some of the Paris attacks said precisely this, that the solution to the migration problem is the conversion of Muslims to Christianity. Which is, which is, which is, well, it's, it's, it's refreshingly uh, reactionary. <laughs> uh, but I don't think very realistic. <laughs> um, no, I don't think we have a, an answer to the, to the collapse of religiosity because it's, uh, it's the result of deep uh, social processes that, uh, that nobody has any control over. The Polish church is trying to do that um, by a, a latter-day uh, alliance between church and, uh, and state. And, um, you know, we have religion it's, uh, in schools. We, we now have um, uh, a new law that has banned um, uh, Sunday trading. You know, the hope is that people stop going to uh, malls and go back to church. A and a few other attempts, I don't think it will work because it's uh, youngsters find, you know, find their smartphones more interesting than anything else, let alone religion. Um, uh, and whereas, no, I, I disagree with you that, that the populists are dominant in the media as regards the migration issue. I think liberals are, are, are embarrassed and unable to make the case. And, and, it, and if they did, it would be, um, it, 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 it could resonate quite widely. Um, um, and I think I've made the argument already that, that Europe is the only um, 
level at which you can actually solve the issue. L let's be clear about um, uh, what was happening at the height of the uh, um, crisis. It wasn't that the boats with migrants were coming to Europe. They were leaving, for example, the Libyan coast, three miles, sometimes 500 meters, destroying the boat, and then uh, European NGO ships would pick them up and take them to Italy or France. That's what's happened. That's what was happening. Um, so we were inviting undocumented uh, people without visas uh, uh, into Europe. And, uh, you know, I, it's all very... Uh, you can argue all kinds of sides of the story ethically. But, but you now have a reaction of, of the threatened majority, at least in some countries. OK, let me switch to uh, uh, the, the uh, situation in which we accept a couple of questions, OK, because I see a lot of hands up, uh, and then you will respond. To, uh, so, gentlemen, over there. Thank you very much. Thank you for a very interesting talks. Uh, you touched on a lot of issues. Oh, uh, my name is Wukas Rahel. I'm a PhD uh, economics student here at Harvard. Um, you talked a lot about uh, the electorate, and that was all very interesting. I had a slightly different question, which often I, th I feel is important in trying to figure out what might happen going forward. And this is a great panel, I think, to ask this question, which is, uh, what do you think drives the leaders um, of uh, of these ruling parties in Eastern Europe. Um, I mean, now with the election in Hungary, we uh, you know all read the story about Viktor Orban going to uh, Oxford, funded by George Soros, and going through a ma massive transformation in terms of his views. Uh, but even more interestingly, the case of Kaczynski is uh, is just fascinating because uh, it is uh, you know the the deep motives. Um, could be very different, you know. You could you could have very different views, and I'll just I'll just be very curious about what your views on that are. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, for the panel. I remember uh, when I visited Hungary in um, 2005, and I visited Hungary a couple of times. Uh, talk. I remember talking to driver, uh, to um, common people, if you like. And migration wasn't an issue, and um, all, all the symptoms you are you mentioned today earlier in the panel were, were, were not mentioned. I remember I, I'm Dr. Haji Zada, a Fulbright Scholar at Davis Center here. I'm from Azerbaijan, so for me, um, Azerbaijan uh, was included in Eastern Neighborhood uh, Partnership in 2004, and Hungary is a uh, 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 post-socialist country. So for me, this uh, in 2005, I had a lot of questions uh, to ask uh, peop common people on the ground, if you like, and they 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 did not. F f I was excited about my questions. I thought they are gonna uh, be excited as well in their response, but people were not uh, did not seem to be very happy uh, about being uh, just in the EU and. I asked questions like, is it better now or was it better at that time? Common people, they told me they didn't feel the difference. So therefore, uh, I think we are now dealing with uh, symptoms rather than the root cause of, of the rising populism or whatever is behind uh, the, whatever really stands behind the, the problem. Um, my question will be, um, so, and this, you know, European integration started in the Western Europe, expanded to Central and Eastern. Now we have um, a European neighborhood policy with elevated uh, uh, level with the Eastern partnership. And uh, European Commission always makes sure that uh, DCFTA is a precondition, deep and comprehensive free trade agreement is a precondition for all Eastern partnership countries uh, to become uh, associated, affiliated, or partnered with the EU. So I, I am worried that, you know, th that excitement that Hungary, Poland, the big bank countries had, and now 
uh, that is not there. So I wonder whether whether it's the scenario for the Eastern Partnership uh, countries as well. Uh, so what is the rationale uh, you think behind the EU support for the Eastern uh, Partnership? Is it more about the moral obligation uh, it received support from the US to integrate uh, Western Europe and now to pass it on? Thank you. Let me bring one more question. So, uh, could you pass uh, uh, the mic to Jens? Thank you. I'm uh, Jens Blom Hansen, a visiting professor of political science from Denmark here at the CES. Um, I was wondering if there is more, if you think there's more that the EU can do to influence the situation in the Visegrad countries or whether the EU can somehow do what it does in a different way. In particular, I think there's one person who is almost invisible in this whole uh, scenario, and that's Commission President Juncker. It seems to me that he is delegating everything to Vice President uh, Timmermans. It's also Timmermans, who is in Warsaw today, I think. Uh, so would it somehow help if the Commission President personally took a deeper interest in this issue and investigated more personal authority in this situation? Okay, great. We have a set of great questions. Jacques. Uh, okay, uh, the, what drives the, <laughs> what drives uh, Orban, Kaczynski and few others, well, uh, in the case of Orban, you could say, I mean, you know the trajectories of Orban, right, from, from, uh, uh, from liberal uh, to conservative to really um, uh, very hardline nationalist. So, you can say I, this, uh, there's an element of opportunism. Uh, in the 1990s, there was not much room on the liberal side because the, there was a liberal party which was in alliance with the socialists and, and uh, uh, there was a vacant <laughs> spot, so to speak, on, on the right. So at first you say, well, this is pure opportunism and you can reassure yourself in thinking that. Uh, okay, that, that means there are certain limits. What is it? I think then comes a moment when <laughs> it's no longer, uh, it, may, it may have been opportunism at first, it, it has become a successful recipe. Uh, uh, and you don't give up a successful recipe for, uh, if, if it works, it delivers. You can see the reaction results. So when uh, Orban and Kaczynski say, uh, and meet in Krynica and say, we need a cultural counter-revolution in Europe, you know, uh, uh, this is it. They, they, they feel this, this is a winning ticket. And of course, the uh, rest of Europe thinks, my God, you know, here are counter-revolutionaries coming. So this is not just liberals becoming conservatives. They become reactionaries in some, you know. So this is, uh, uh, you have, uh, um, Mark Lilla has a book about uh, 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 that theme about uh, reactionaries. And I think perhaps this is a book one will have to read to, to, to understand uh, the, the, the drift. So I think that uh, uh, in the case of Kaczynski, I mean, you, you would be better <laughs> placed to, oh, I have the film, here is somebody who's been consistent, very uh, convinced uh, from the beginning, and, and, uh, and uh, if he was just interested in, in the appearance of power, he would have ceased, he would have been uh, prime minister or something like that. He prefers to be kind of Natchalnik, you know, leading from behind, uh, 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 but very effectively. Uh, in, his, uh, in his own uh, way. So, uh, um, yeah, I think what is interesting in the two cases, they are former dissidents. And this is this interesting thing. The people assume that because they were dissidents, because they were opposing a totalitarian regime, etc., that they necessarily will be, you know, pluralist, liberal democrats. That, that, uh, uh, that was a stereotype, and, and, and uh, uh, that is not true. There are a lot of people who opposed communism, uh, who uh, who are not pluralist democrats? They had other reasons uh, uh, for for opposing. Uh, uh, so you know, uh, I remember in former Yugoslavia, it's a completely different case. But I mean, the, 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 the people who had who were opposing communists, among them, you had uh, somebody like Shechel. Shechel was uh, a, a, a very hard, you know, uh, was put in jail by Tito, and that uh, uh, then he became a rabid nationalist and ended up in the the court uh, in, the, in The Hague uh, as a war criminal. Uh, so uh, being a dissident is not, <laughs> is not a sufficient uh, uh, qualification. So uh, uh, 
that's one point. I, I don't want to, I mean, there are the other questions. Eastern partnership, that is the one uh, definitely for, uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for you. I would simply add on, on, on this before, before you answer that one, is that when it was launched, that seemed like a continuation of a successful enlargement policy. So you have a context in which you think, this is enlargement, this is how it has worked. Lots of academic literature about leverage and how uh, EU contributed to the democratization. And the idea was, can you extend this logic to the periphery uh, uh, further east uh, in, in particular? And I think that what we have seen is, uh, is, is the limits of that, of that uh, uh, policy. And uh, uh, what we have seen recently is the implosion, actually, of our neighborhoods. This is where the neighborhood policy <laughs> has run into trouble, because you had an implosion of that uh, neighborhood in the east with the Ukrainian uh, uh, hybrid war, and in the south with the Islamic uh, 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 collapse of, uh, of, of states from, from Libya all the way to, to, to Syria. So the, 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 the neighborhood policy, the way it was conceived, uh, is, is, is out of sync with, uh, uh, with reality. And in the current state of weakness and division inside the EU, I don't see the energy for uh, uh, promoting uh, a new drive, openness towards uh, 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 Eastern partnership in particular, I would say the countries that were most committed to it are the countries we are talking about. The Visegrad countries within the EU, they were the promoters of uh, uh, Eastern partnership. And then you discover that they are now in uh, a very tense argument with the EU itself. So uh, not a very comfortable position to be promoting <laughs> further enlargement uh, uh, in, in the East. Um, anyway, um, I don't know whether, I mean, here is one of the uh, uh, promoters, uh, initial promoters of the Eastern partnership. So maybe you are more optimistic about it than I am. Uh, uh, yes, I did invent it. Um, <laughs> Uh, yes. <laughs> um, and the idea was um, that it threw the ball for the smash. <laughs> that it would be um, an Eastern Visegrad group, uh, namely a way for these countries to collaborate amongst themselves mm -hmm. in such a manner as to convince us in the EU that they are capable of being clubbable and therefore might one day be considered to be me to, for membership. And, um, and formally speaking, Eastern Partnership is a huge success, uh, particularly if you compare it with a, a project um, uh, that was supposed to play the same role in the southern neighborhood, mm -hmm. namely, uh, namely the Union for the Mediterranean, which is 10, 10 or 15 years older, and which has literally nothing to show for itself. Whereas in Eastern Partnership, we now have deep and comprehensive free trade areas with, um, uh, with Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia, and uh, certainly Moldova and Ukraine, I'm not sure about Georgia, have visa-free, yeah. Georgia also, access uh, to the EU, which is in that part of the world is important, that passports from these countries are are more valuable than some other passports. Um, but I agree with you. It's by becoming problem nations for the EU, uh, the current, the Visegrad group have, have revived the worst, uh, the worst uh, uh, stereotypes about Central Europe and, um, uh, and have um, persuaded the Westerners that somehow we are different and somehow, and, and that certainly we don't want to import any more trouble from the East. So we are killing that which is in our best Absolutely. national interest. And, uh, and that's very sad. And, uh, and it's against both the European interest, but in particular against uh, the interests of Central Europe. Um, but you know, if only in politics people would do what is in their own interest, life would be so much simpler. <laughs> um, as regards um, uh, what drives the leaders, I think it's most helpful just to listen to what they say. Because if you, 
analyze the speeches, uh, the public pronouncements of, 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 of the world's non-democratic leaders, they are usually, it's usually all on the table. It's just that we can't believe that they can be in, in earnest, right? So, for example, in Poland, Mr. Kaczynski has said what he wants. First of all, he wants to take revenge on uh, people that he sees as the murderers of his uh, brother. Tomorrow, we have the eighth anniversary of the Smolensk crash. They've been trying to prove that it was an assassination. They failed, but they blame us, the previous government, for a supposed conspiracy with the Russians anyway. Um, uh, and secondly, uh, Kaczynski used to have uh, uh, an idea of Poland as a sort of Bavaria, traditional on values, modern on the economy. But I think the, the vision has been going backwards in time, and, and I think his idea is now a sort of Father Tiso Slovakia. Yeah. Uh, and the reason for that is that he is unbelievably provincial. He literally is incapable of looking at himself and our country uh, the way it appears to foreigners. Uh, because think about it, someone who has never read a foreign newspaper, who has only been abroad three times, always on official business, never for pleasure, or, or let alone living some somewhere and really feeling what it's like to, to, to be abroad. Um, so it's, it, it's also a failure of imagination uh, that is to some extent characteristic of his generation. We fought to get our nation state back from uh, um, uh, hege he he hegemon, the Soviet Union. Some people find it hard to admit that today you cannot realize all the interests of Polish citizens at the national level, that you need the supranational level, and only then are our interests truly protected. And, you know, when, when the politics of class and, and national resentment, national socialism, are also efficient politically and to help you win elections, What's not to like? Okay, we have a couple of more questions. Uh, uh, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Aisha. I'm one of the uh, visiting scholars here. Um, you know, I always think uh, populism is what gives legitimacy to authoritarian policies. Uh, so the importance of populism is really that it enables authoritarian policies. Um, policies uh, that jeopardize uh, rule of law, separation of powers, checks and balances, you know, which is uh, one of the reasons why EU actually reacted to the law in, uh, you know, Poland, uh, right? Uh, and, um, you know, I, I'm a scholar uh, from Istanbul, and Copenhagen criteria is something uh, that is in the nightmares of uh, many Turkish citizens, you know, like uh, there was a time when everyone would you know, go to bed with it, uh, wake up with it, you know, trying to fulfill the Copenhagen criteria. Uh, it didn't happen. Turkey moved in a totally different direction. Uh, is not, I, it doesn't seem like the government is interested in uh, following the EU uh, membership goal anymore. I mean, that's over with. In fact, Turkey now is the gatekeeper of uh, Europe without becoming a member uh, of EU. Uh, but, um, you know, I mean, putting that aside, you know, I wonder what, I mean, there must be some importance laid on Copenhagen criteria for member countries too. And now when I look at the member countries, you know, I mean, I mean they're not meeting actually. Some of, there are some members that are not meeting the Copenhagen criteria. Uh, anyway, I just want to mention this because, um, I mean, is there any policy of dealing with this, you know? Uh, because there's always this unanimity, like Orban is blocking the sanctions against Poland and, you know, and this is, so this is killing EU, you know. Um, uh, eventually, that's what it's going to cause. So um, my question actually is um, this, 
rising authoritarianism that we are witnessing uh, through policies that you know gradually uh, jeopardize the values of EU, right? I mean, even that argument, as uh, Jacques Rupnik was saying, that argument, the values of EU argument, has been hijacked by the populists, right? Uh, uh, but there is something. I mean, we all know what we're talking about when we say the values of Europe, you know, uh, Copenhagen criteria. We know what they are. Um, so, I mean, what can, you know, uh, what can you do, uh, and I can't help but ask the counterfactual question, uh, would it have been different if uh, the, uh, the EU constitution was there, you know, I mean, if that movement was successful? And also, uh, I can't help but wonder, um, I mean, what does, I, I, my, that question is to you, actually, this, this second one. Um, the... Um, what can opposition parties do uh, when uh, I'm going to uh, second Ben's remarks about f f press freedom? I mean, uh, Freedom House just uh, lowered also Poland's, even Poland's uh, status, you know, at, to partially free, right? So when there's no press freedom, uh, how can opposition political parties fight this? I mean, do they just um, boycott the elections? Do they just... Uh, you know, go to the grassroots, uh, or do they just sit and wait for this nightmare to be over? What do they do? What do they do, really? <laughs> well, uh, thank you for the panel. I have two questions. The first one is, is there or not any influence by Russia that might be considered behind the success of all these populist movements? in Central European uh, countries, but also, for example, in Italy, and I guess in Marine Le Pen case. Uh, and the second one is, well, voters do not decide just on the economic growth and so on and so forth. But if it's a, pos a positive trend, and we will not find a lot of other reason to vote out these guys of the parliament, so which will be the reason to actually uh, stop voting people like Orban for uh, the Hungarian or uh, Duda in Poland. I mean, when this kind of political explosion of the populism will finish in this country? Okay, let me add one more question in the spirit of, uh, 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 of the idea that it's very hard to make predictions, especially about the future. Um, uh, are we beyond the point of no return? Uh, can we imagine the situation that uh, Orban or Kaczynski will give up power? Uh, uh, so can, can democracy be saved after all the things which already happened on the ground in those countries? I'm relatively um, optimistic about Poland because um, we are very contrarian people and we've brought down worse regimes than that in the past. Um, um, also, Poland is bigger. You know, Hungary is one city plus the countryside. Um, and a quarter of the population live in Budapest. Whereas in Poland, you have these rich, big, important cities where the opposition is actually in charge. And in Poland, um, we have media pluralism still. Um, the biggest, the most popular now TV station is actually owned by uh, the Discovery Channel. It's American. And the government have tried to start bringing under control, but uh, the administration told them to, um, to back off, and they have. The biggest uh, news magazine is German-owned. The biggest tabloid is German-owned. There are important web um, portals which are, which are non-pro-government. It's true that public media have been completely, uh, I mean, imagine if, if NPR was taken over by, by Breitbart and you have a picture of what's been done to Polish public media. Uh, but that's not the entire picture. Um, you know, I mean, Poland and Turkey go back a long way. We, have, we, we were celebrating a few years ago 600 uh, years of our diplomatic relations. It's one of the oldest diplomatic relationship in the world. But, you know, even at the height of this uh, uh, Copenhagen criteria, I always had a, a suspicion that the uh, Islamists were using this to destroy 
the 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 power behind Turkish secularism, which was the army, and it worked. Um, uh, what is to be done? Well, um, uh, our Danish friend is also uh, asking about that. Uh, should it be Juncker? Um, Commissioner Ettinger has said that uh, the rules on tying um, the disbursements of EU funds to uh, rule of law will be in the bylaws uh, of, the, uh, of the multi-annual budget. And it actually makes sense because if you don't have rule of law, if, um, if courts and institutions don't work properly, then European funds are liable to be misused. Um, and at the bylaw level, you don't, you, you don't have unanimity. So you can actually adopt this stuff. So Europe should think about things that will work rather than make a fuss about stuff that is purely uh, uh, declaratory. And the other thing that's happening, I think there was a development today in Ireland. An Irish court has refused to extradite under a European arrest warrant to Poland a criminal uh, and, f and tabled a question, I think, to the European Court of Justice whether the Polish court system can be trusted to give him a fair trial. You see, that also works because that's, that's a perfectly fair question, you know, doubt to have. And this will have an effect uh, because, you know, the European Union is based on the presumption of mm -hmm institutions in member states trusting one another. You know, that consuls will, will only grant visas to people who may enter the Schengen zone, that courts will not cheat, you know, investors and, uh, and, and so on. Um, and Poland needs to understand that rule of law, uh, that, that, that Europe can't draw back, can't give Poland a pass because it undermines the whole system. Um, uh, influenced by Russia is interesting because um, uh, uh, Poles are as arrogant about this as Americans. They think, no, influenced by Russia and Poland, but we are so anti-Russian, it can't work. Uh, and Americans were equally uh, on different grounds. Russians interfering in our elections, that no, they wouldn't dare, right? And both are wrong. Um, the, the misunderstanding in Poland is because they think that Russian propaganda would work like old Soviet propaganda. Love, you know, you should love the Soviet Union. Whereas today's Russia doesn't care what you think about Russia. What it wants is to destroy the West, NATO, the European Union, uh, 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 set member states against one another. So the issue on which you can most precisely track uh, Russian interference in Polish politics is how they've managed to uh, create hostility between Poland and Ukraine, which wasn't there three years ago. Okay? And you can easily, um, um, uh, and you know why, right? And the at I can personally show you how the Russian interference worked because I received the same emails from the same servers, from the same uh, dodgy company called the Fancy Burrs that attacked uh, John Podesta. And he just clicked and I didn't. I referred the email to our secret service and he clicked. And, um, and it all started with, uh, with the Anschluss of, um, of Crimea and, uh, and Donbass. That's when the Russians started uh, their hybrid warfare against, against the West and Western politicians. Um, and what can you do about it all? Um, well, in Poland, it's very clear. I mean, the ruling party got 38% of the vote at the last general election. In the current opinion polls, they have 30. They're still the largest party, but the opposition has the majority. So if they 
and, and, and at the last election, two left-wing parties went into the uh, election separately and both failed to meet the threshold. So 13% of the vote was wasted. So if they make the same mistake, they will again be defeated. If they unite at least into blocks that are sure to make it into parliament, they can easily defeat these guys. But, you know, history is also made by, incom by political incompetence, which cannot be excluded. <laughs> Jack, you have two minutes. Uh, two minutes. Okay. Uh, on Russia, I will not dwell on it. I would simply say there is, of course, in each of the countries, uh, you can observe uh, Russian uh, activities. I find, personally, uh, I, yes, it exists. Yes, it might have some influence. But basically, there is now a tendency to explain everything through that. You know, you have a Catalan crisis, and now you have people sort of pretending seriously that the Catalan problem uh, has to do with Russia. I'm not saying that maybe Russians have not, but come on. <laughs> Catalan issue is a very old one. The Catalan nationalists <laughs> have been around, and, 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 and Mr. Puigdemont is not, is not, uh, is not on the KGB payroll. So, I, I, no, I, uh, and same thing could be said about, uh, you know, have, uh, uh, have the Italian election been influenced? Or, uh, okay, so that, that would be my... And in, in, uh, simply uh, on, on the rational factor, this is where Visegrad is not a united bloc. Interesting, you know, the, 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 the Polish take on, on, on Putin is certainly not the same as Orban. In fact, the Hungarian opposition has used pictures with Orban and Putin sitting next to each other to, as a campaign against Orban, which is an irony. You know, here is, here is the opposition trying to uh, 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 attack uh, Orban on this. And uh, you have a uh, Czech president, Zeman, uh, um, you know, known for his uh, pro-Russian uh, uh, s sympathies or things like that uh, didn't prevent him from uh, from winning and uh, yeah you have people like Fico who is opposed to sanction on Russia because of Ukraine so there is no Visegrad block on uh, relations with uh, Russia um, yes the question you've uh, you've asked about uh, yeah that's a very I don't have the time really to, to deal with it seriously but uh, what I think is, 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 is that the so-called Copenhagen criteria, uh, they work very effectively in, in the period of pre-accession. They're much more difficult to enforce after, as we have, uh, uh, as we have discovered. Uh, uh, partly because for procedural reasons, because you have veto, you, you know all the difficult constraints, you have that. Now there is an attempt to link it to, uh, uh, to the budgetary question. We will see how far uh, uh, that one goes. Uh, but there is a political argument indeed there, because uh, uh, if you say these funds, these transfers, or whatever you want to call them, uh, this is not market. This is based on political bond, okay? This is based on the solidarity principle. It's a political bond. If you tell us there is no political bond, <laughs> then maybe uh, uh, there is, uh, we should re-examine, you see? And, and, and yeah, uh, that, uh, that's a way to get budgetary discussion into a uh, political one, and, and that, may be, uh, that may be an efficient leverage. Why I think that leverage is... Uh, um, uh, has been limited is because these new, call them whatever, national populist movement, etc., have received very strong legitimation by what has happened outside East Central Europe. Uh, the uh, Brexit, first of all, you should, you should see how they received Brexit. This was an immediate you know, response. We are, this is it. We bring back repatriation of powers to national governments. This is the message. This was a Visegrad message immediately, including the Czechs and the Slovak. This was the message. Who was guilty for breakfast? The European Commission, because they were pushing too much for integration, uh, etc. Then the American election. <laughs> uh, read Orban's interview the day after, in Daily Telegraph, the day after Trump's election. I quote, the liberal non-democracy is over. What a day, what a day, what a day. He cannot repress his enthusiasm. And of course, it's a rigid image. You pointing fingers at us, you tell us we are sort of periphery, uh, unruly, uh, post-communist nationalists. No, 
we were the vanguard, we were ahead of the game. And now with Trump and with Brexit, that is the two countries which represented in Central Europe, uh, you know, the anchor of liberal democracy, they going the way we are headed. So the legitimation works that way. And that is, of course, a very strong thing to argue. You know, it's very thing, very strong thing to undo. So when Orban says, when we, uh, when we uh, in 1989, we thought Europe was our future. Now we think we are the future of Europe. This is a speech he made last summer. Stop you, Jacques. This is a great point to finish. We, we are, out we of are the time. future of Europe. Yeah, this is a great way. <laughs> uh, please join me to thank uh, Jacques Rupnik and uh, Radio Sosikovsky.